And I'm Paul Rossi with 910 Drones. We help individuals, businesses, and organizations lever leverage drones, whether it's uh, flying for them or helping them fly themselves with the training and program building. But without further ado, I want to jump into this drone uh, drones in video production webinar, which most of you see. Uh, pictures are phenomenal, but video is just absolutely incredible. If you jump on Netflix, uh, one second here. Um, if you're on Netflix at all these days, uh, especially with how things are going, just about any show that you turn on, you're going to recognize that there is some sort of uh, aerial uh, clip video portion in just about any of the shows you watch, whether it's House Hunting or Ozark, um, even if it's Money Heist, uh, which is a popular one. So drones are really becoming a big part of uh, video production, marketing, uh, and, and what folks do. So what I want to do right now is I'm going to introduce uh, each of our guests one at a time, and I'm going to start with Christy Lowe. Uh, Christy Lowe is the owner of Christy Lowe Productions based here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Christy Lowe is a mom. She's a wife to a military veteran, uh, Emmy Award winning journalist, and uh, a certified remote pilot. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Christy to go ahead and join us and introduce herself. Hey everybody, it's Christy with Christy Lowe Productions. Thanks for uh, joining us today. I started my career actually as a television news reporter, did that for about 20 years, and, um, and then got into the video production for companies and government entities, and didn't get into drones actually until a couple of years ago. Um, I was doing a lot of marketing and training videos and things like that for my clients, and realized kind of the impact that drones were having in the industry in terms of marketing your businesses and also doing um, government um, property surveys for like pre-construction conditions, things like that. And I said to myself, Silk, you know, you might want to look at getting, getting a drone and providing that to your clients, you know, because there other people were doing it and I certainly didn't want to fall behind the curve in what I was available to offer. Oops, hello. Um, I didn't want to fall behind the curve in what I was able to offer my clients. So I begrudgingly decided to um, study for the FAA license, got my license, got the drone, and have been using it ever since. And it's been a really, really good asset to have for our clients. So I'm glad I did it. I didn't want to do it at first, but I'm glad I did. Excellent. Awesome. That's great. Well, thank you, Christy. Uh, I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to bring on uh, ben Armstrong. Ben Armstrong is the uh, CEO with Nine Miles Media. Nine Miles Media is based here in North Carolina. Um, ben is a certified a remote pilot and uh, in his spare time he's also a EMT, I believe, um, in Wake County. So Ben, uh, thanks for joining us and please go ahead now and introduce yourself. Oh, great to be with you. Great to be part of the panel. Uh, it's always fun when you can get fellow pilots of drones and all sorts of things together and, and chat. Uh, hanging around the, the hangar comes pretty naturally to me. I'm a uh, third generation pilot, fourth generation entrepreneur. Uh, my entire family is all about business and airplanes and everything in between. So um, it always came naturally to me to want to learn to fly. When I was about eight years old, I, I was able to fly my dad's amphibious aircraft, my grandfather's 1941 J3 Cub that I uh, still have today. And so I think that the to think about how far technology has come and to think about how these days for just a couple hundred dollars, you can have something that will fit in your backpack or on the palm of your hand, connect to your smartphone, allow you to stream live to Facebook, just like what we're doing right now on this webinar. Uh, and anybody can do that with relatively minimal oversight and regulation and all that sort of stuff, at least in the United States. I mean, it's a pretty remarkable time to be in this industry. Uh, Nine Miles Media is a creative agency based out of downtown Raleigh. We've grown extremely quickly from a team of five just a couple years ago to 14 people. 
Uh, we provide creative solutions, especially around new media, video production. A lot of that has to do with drones, as well as digital advertising campaigns with $27 million of direct ad management experience across lots of different industries. So we kind of get to be involved in this world from, from both angles, from the client side and the agency perspective as well. So happy to be here. Excellent. Uh, excellent. And again, thank you for being here, Ben. And that's great. You brought up a, a good point in regards to um, the cost, right, of, of the technology and how because the cost has gone down, it's uh, more easy to integrate this tool uh, into the, the video production work. Um, now at this time, I'm going to bring on uh, Trevor Bryson and Jimmy Dempsey. Uh, Trevor Bryson and uh, Trevor and Jimmy are with Glide Aerials. Uh, taking y'all off hold. They're with Glide Aerials. They're established in Los Angeles in 2012, and they are leading uh, a leading industry drone company specializing in uh, drone, cable cam, uh, Movi, and Ronin. And uh, the work that they're doing uh, across the uh, globe is, is absolutely phenomenal. So. Uh, Guys, thanks for joining us, and I'm going to go ahead and let you guys uh, tell, tell uh, our audience what you guys are up to. Hey, how's it going? I'm Trevor, and uh, I'm, I'm half, Jimmy. Half of Glide Aerials is the other half. Um, okay. Right now, obviously, we've been locked down since March, so we're just kind of trying to stay creative and think of ways we can expand our business and, and uh, try to learn new skills and stay on top of the old skills that we have, so we've been kind of doing that, and and recently, the, the phones just kind of started to start ringing again with some calls coming in about some work. And so that's kind of been really promising. And, and uh, we're kind of ex really excited just to kind of get back to work and, and, uh, and, and do what we love doing. So, yeah. Yeah. The that we do is uh, vi uh, production, production work, mostly TV shows, documentaries. Um, we'll do a few features every so often, documentaries. So. But yeah, that's our that's our main bread and butter. Excellent. And you guys kind of work together in order to tackle this larger um, this 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 industry that's growing, right? And, and just constantly changing. So the the aspect that you guys bring to it from this, you know, working together um, for folks that are looking to kind of grow outside of of their area. That's that's great. So I'm glad that you guys bring that aspect to this conversation. So at this time, I'm going to um, bring everybody in, um, Jimmy, Trevor, Christy, and Ben, and hey guys. just, just hey. hey, how are you? <clears throat> and uh, at this point, want to kind of talk about, um, just go through this agenda, or not agenda, but kind of uh, topics that we want to discuss, starting with the hardware, moving into some of the software, whether it's editing or maybe there's something uh, related to the drone specifically that we can talk about. Um, and then move into talking about uh, customers, clients, um, finding work, you know, people that are starting out um, that are listening in that might want to know like some insightful tips or, or tricks on how to kind of get your videos out there. Um, and, and then once we have the job, it's kind of what, uh, operational procedures are associated with drones and video production, um, especially if we're working on a set and maybe there's just like a one take. You know, how do you, um, and maybe you don't do anything, but when we get there, we can discuss like how do you, uh, <laughs> right, how do you simulate or do a test run for a, a one take shot when maybe you have to have to have someone running through pretending to be something? Um, so those kinds of things I'd like to dive into a little bit, but to start out, hardware. Um, so Ben, um, since you're right here, uh, I'm going to ask you if you want to kind of just dive into a little bit about hardware and what Nine Miles Media is leveraging. Yeah, sure. So I, like everybody else here, I'm probably kind of a gearhead and into the technical side of what we do. And I'm sure that's interesting to everybody. Although I, I like to remind our clients that, hey, it's not the camera that does the shot. It's not the drone that achieves the look. It's really the skill of the operator. Um, and it's really the skill of the cinematographer who happens to have a 
camera that's mounted with some propellers going through the air. So uh, what we use is a little bit less probably technical than Jimmy and those guys. Um, but what we're looking at is a X7 camera mounted on a DJI Inspire 2. Um, and we'll fly that with dual operators. Uh, so we're fully invested in the DJI ecosystem and, and that's what's most comfortable for us. We came from a background of building our own drones for a long time with custom controllers and all that sort of stuff back when that was the really, really cool thing to do about six years ago. And uh, since then, we've really kind of standardized on DJI. So love the Inspire 2 platform. It is big. I mean, for us, that's big. I know some folks fly the heavy lifter stuff, but for <laughs> us, that feels big. It feels like you're driving a truck. Um, and so what I honestly love is the Mavic series. So we will run the Mavic Air 2 zoom model um, and then some of the newer stuff as well. And those are awesome. They're really quick sport mode. You can, you know, grab some really nice pickup shots, especially if you're doing, you know, moving boats or things that are moving pretty quick, very small, very, you know, very tough and uh, just awesome platform all around. So uh, big fan of any of the DJI stuff uh, that's more recently been produced, especially with the most recent versions of OcuSync and, you know, going over from Lightbridge and that kind of stuff. So long range is important for us. A lot of times we're trying to achieve a shot that's, that's pretty far off in the distance. Um, dual operators on the Inspire 2, definitely like an added layer of safety there. And uh, usually we're connecting folks up with uh, headsets. So just the ear tech headsets like everybody uses. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So you made two really awesome points, which was, um, the dual operation, which over here, I don't know how everyone else's cameras are set up, but like right here, we got dual operators. Um, and then over here, <laughs> some Mavic 2 action. So the fact that you mentioned both those was awesome. You couldn't have set the table any better, Ben. Um, I want to go to Christy and talk to you because I know um, that you are flying that Mavic 2 Pro platform. And, and I just want to hear how... Um, you know, your thoughts, you know, regarding yeah. equipment. Yeah, absolutely. Of, of the three of us, I probably am um, operating on the simplest, right, with the simplest set of equipment. Um, I actually started off with the Phantom series before I moved up to the Mavic Pro 2. For what I'm doing on the commercial level and the government level in terms of training and marketing, I don't find that I need to step up to the Inspire and have a two-person operation. I can accomplish my goals, which is great cinematography at the level that I need to be at for my clients with the Mavic Pro 2. And I can tell you the picture quality is pretty darn good on that drone. And so if you know, like uh, Benjamin was saying, if you know how to get the shots you want to get, from a cinematography or videography perspective, it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily need a super expensive drone to do that. You just need to know how to utilize and work with what you have. So I like the fact that with the Mavic Pro 2, you have a lot of features on there that allow you to get some of the more complicated shots by yourself, right? With the follow feature where you can um, have a subject, you know, or a vehicle driving off into the distance and you can set the drone to follow that object while you focus not so much on the flying, but more on getting that shot that you want. And I also like the fact that it has a lot of the different color settings, um, just like the DJI um, Osmo series, which I use for a lot of my groundwork, which I know this isn't about groundwork, but they're very similar. I'm a big DJI fan like Benjamin. So um, I like the features that you get with the Mavic Pro 2 and the picture quality that you can get once you learn how to use all those features. It's been great. Yeah. Remarkable value. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And then exactly what you mentioned, Christy, that Ben had said was it's not about the tool or actually I say tool, but the drone. You can have the biggest, nicest, fanciest drone. Um, and if you don't know how to operate it or you don't know how to capture that content, it, it doesn't matter. And then you can have the Mavic too, you can have or the Mavic Air, you can have a Mavic Mini in your hands. And if you know how to, you know, fly it well, keep that steady um, image, you, know, you, you can do great things with it. Um, so now I want to jump to Jimmy and Trevor because that dual operator uh, portion was mentioned. And, you know, you guys being a team going out on, onto these jobs, I'd imagine you guys are doing a lot of a dual operation. Yeah, I, I definitely have to echo everybody in saying, like, it's definitely, you can, the nice thing about Glide Aerials is we, we, we try to use every platform 
from Mavic Air all the way up to Alta. And I got to say, uh, Inspire 2 is also our bread and butter as far as a dual operation machine. Um, since the X7 camera has come out with uh, the, uh, the lenses and the sensor, uh, you know, the, the heavy lifter has kind of fallen off just because of the ease of the, uh, you know, getting this machine in the air. We can get the Inspire 2 in the air really quickly. Uh, uh, being able to record raw to the SSD ha has so much latitude for everybody in post that the heavy lifter has kind of fallen off the back and, and Inspire 2 has really become our bread and butter. So we are, we are on the DJI boat and we love everything that DJI puts out. We use uh, pretty much all their products. Uh, um, and, uh, you can and, 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 it really, it really depends on the client too. So depending on what your clientele is really depicts on what, drone you're going to use but if this is going to be like if it's a lower budget thing that's like say it's a reality show or a smaller docu-series and you're going to be out with them for three months that production company is not going to be able to particularly afford an inspire 2 or something they're going to want something that's a one-man thing so then you have your mavic pro 2 which i love flying that thing i take that with me everywhere i travel to and it's like it's for what you get for hyperlapses and for everything you can do, it's fantastic. But so everything has its everything has its purpose. It's just understanding when you can bring it in and if it's something you can offer to your clients, I guess. But I think from a from a dual operator standpoint, we 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 run a dual sentence controllers. Um, we, we love everything about it. Um, it's it's been a really seamless machine for us. We don't have a lot of problems with it. Obviously, it's always important to have a backup machine, you know, with you at all times because you know, that these things aren't hundred percent. So, you know, we always try to have that as well. And, and uh, but really it's Inspire 2 has been our bread and butter as far as hardware. And, and we love it from a dual operating standpoint. Now I imagine you guys came over from the Inspire 1 like I did, totally different animal in terms of reliability and just kind of clunkiness and trying to get it in the air and, oh, let me turn it off, let me turn it on and yep. all that, twist yeah. the camera. Okay, anyway, it's a different world. It's really yeah. come a long way. Yeah, and just the way it flies too, the Inspire 2, with the tripod mode and it really allows you to to kind of butter those shots out and it can make like a lower level uh drone operator really confident in making smooth moves even as a single operator on inspire 2. yeah and you brought out a good point too about the portability of the the new inspire and versus like the smaller drones like the um what I've got with the um, Mavic, because we actually did a docu series, not a docu series, but a mini doc in Honduras a couple years ago when the, with the older Mavic. And it was great for that because we were out in the remote wilderness, you know, for two weeks yeah. with limited battery charging capability. And to try to do something with the Inspire would have been a nightmare. So the smaller drone for that application was great. Yeah. Perfect. Just kind of toss it in your backpack and away you go, you know? I, I tell everybody it's like a shoe. Like I, I was just amazed. And, and yeah, there are other drones out there that fold up and are compact, the Autel and, and things like that. Um, but when it folds up into a shoe and then, and then <laughs> you, you know, I, I used to take my shoe off like this and I would tell people, this is how big the drone is. And then I'd say, no, really look, you know, it's, that's a good salesman. I like it. <laughs> the size of a shoe. Yeah. Good thing I got my nice shoes on today. New Balance, send me a little bit of, uh, send me something. Um, <clears throat> but the fact that it can fold up, and then when you talk about batteries, right, because this battery, 30, you know, 25 minutes, right, in this small pack, and it's, you only need one, the cost, 150 bucks, you can cram how many of these into a fly more kit. So you're walking around with two, three hours worth of battery, and you don't have to charge a thing. I laugh because I would say I'm going to run out of remote um, charge before, you, before I ran out of batteries. But I took that uh, like going on in a plane. I was always a big fan of the Phantom 4 Pro. And I lugged that around New York City just to get a shot. Like carrying that with the family just to get one shot. I was like, this is ridiculous. And when I found, you know, finally converted, not converted, but jumped on the ship, I was like, this is an amazing uh platform and then the zoom i think i just want to point out the mavic 2 zoom it, it definitely doesn't get the credit uh that i think it deserves it doesn't have the one inch sensor but what you can do with that zoom is uh is really incredible so i'll echo that because i think everybody's on the pro train and i've flown the i have pro on the other one i mean it's all good but to me the really cool cinematic shot assuming that you have enough light right and you're not trying to film at dusk 
and you don't necessarily have to have that same large sensor size. I really love the image off of the Zoom platform almost even more, especially if you're trying to get in on somebody who's like a surfer riding a wave or something that's happening that's relatively small. I mean, it's almost like a little news chopper that, like you said, is like the size of a shoe. That's really cool. <laughs> and, it, and it makes for some really op cool opportunities. I and mean, if you want to get really creative with it, you can do some, you know, backup dolly zoom type stuff. I don't do a ton of that. It's more just I slam it all the way to zoomed all the way in and just rock it that way. That works pretty well. Yeah, I'm going to do the quick shout out to the to the to the drone Ubers out there. Right. I tell everybody, don't buy the Zoom if you want to do work for drone base and, and droners, because they're always going to request a 20 megapixel sensor. Why? It's so that they have more ability to crop out and edit your bad work. Um, <laughs> 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 that, that's just that's. <laughs> I don't, that, that's just that's just my my uh joke that i say about that because you know everyone's on that 20 mega pickle pick, pickle 20 mega pickle yeah. but but again it's the tool what can you do with it and like ben said you can get that that dolly zoom that ability to um you know adjust that focal length and shot is is pretty neat uh when it comes down to what's your final platform, I mean, is it going to be published on Instagram and everybody's going to look at it on a two inch wide phone? Well, you know, you may as well have the most flexible platform then because nobody's really going to see it at the exact, you know, pure, most, you know, kind of raw form anyway. So I think there's something to be said for the flexibility of the Zoom as an all around thing versus just the, the pro. So nobody should rule it out. Excellent. And I want to throw this out there. Someone on Facebook had commented about, uh some Amer american they said something about it well we need an american made drone right because we're all on here talking to, you know we're all dji fanboys uh fangirls on here but i'm telling you i have a skydio too i have i have the other stuff it's just right now dji is is, is killing it, it all around but i want to ask is it any uh, uh jimmy trevor uh christy ben have you guys flown the the skydio too oh uh, we haven't no uh, no okay, okay. Um, man, well, I have to get with you, Ben and Christy, and just kind of show show you guys what it is, if nothing else, just to see what's down the road. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'll have to send it out to you guys uh, out there, glide aerials. You guys, no, you don't want it. No, yeah. we'd love oh, to fly. Oh, we'll fly it. I'll fly, fly it. Fly it. Oh, yeah, I'm like, I see Trevor, uh, Jimmy shaking his head like this. No, 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 no. We're we'll fly We're ready. We're ready. We love, we love flying it. All right. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So if you're trying to fly it like just a regular drone and, uh, you know, with the sticks and manual, it's like a school bus. It's like trying to fly a school bus. It's not made for flying manually, but as soon as you lock that thing onto a target, Oh man. I mean, it's, it's gone. This thing zooms is trees, branches. It's, it's incredible. Um, again, 12 megapixels, half inch sensor, but if you're doing the right things with this tool, you can capture things you couldn't have imagined before. So I'm excited about that in advancement. And also with the Air 2, the, the Active Track 3.0, right? Mm -hmm. This new ability to track objects um, while avoiding obstacles. So Well, that could be a good feature for folks who might be prone to crashing their drones. <clears throat> not saying, not saying that. <laughs> I'm not admitting anything here, but <laughs> some obstacle <laughs> avoidance might be good. Hey, and that's what I, that's why I was so impressed with the Skydio too, because I've seen I've had drones go down. Right, you 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 expect you have this five directions of obstacle avoidance, but you know there's always that. Well, it was a leaf, or oh, the diameter was half less than half an inch. Right, there's always that that reason why. Well, there's all the room for user error, right, Jim? You, user <laughs> error. <laughs> <laughs> or you buy the new Phantom 4 Pro with five degrees, and then you realize that it only really works in tripod mode. Um, and you're like, oh, they got me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so those are some of the things that, um, you know, as new things come out, I'm just, just excited to see. So, um, great. I think we kind of beat up hardware there and, and just kind of let folks know um, – Let's see if there's any. Uh, I can say one more thing about hardware. Like, yeah, I really think like the future for us right now that we're really looking at is these little guys. These and these are CineWoop drones, uh, and they're just carrying like a GoPro Hero Eight, Hero Seven, and the cinematic things that you can do with these at high speeds is at another level. And I think Jimmy can speak to it because he's actually the better pilot of both of us on this thing. And 
<laughs> but as far as like high speed, dynamic, in close uh, filming, this is what we're really working on right now. And Jimmy can talk a little bit about it. I mean, it's wicked. I mean, it's just <laughs> super wicked. Like, and the only reason why I've even, see, like, the only reason why I've even gotten any good at it was just from that uh, DRL simulator that you can play on Steam. My MacBook barely handles it, but none, nonetheless, I've been able to get a ton of practice in, and it's been a huge help. So then when I finally, like, jumped on this, it, I, it wasn't, like, an immediate crash, but it was, like, if it wasn't for that, it would, I would have been crashing it so hard every time, like, it's a completely different type of flying, but it's, like, the shots you can get from it, it's, like, it's like riding a roller coaster with no track in front of you. You're just whipping around everywhere and just able to get these corkscrews. You can do loops, anything you want to do to get these. And it's been really good with like fast moving objects. So say it was like a race car on a track or someone mountain biking or uh, snowboarding down some slopes or whatever. This thing can track with anything you want while doing spirals around your subject and everything. It's been super wicked. And the price of it's not bad either. And it's like, I mean, yeah, I mean it's like a like eleven hundred dollar investment for your setup, you know. And you're talking about your goggles and your, and it's your DJI remote, and and it's it's pretty much a DJI platform with DJI FPV, and and you throw a GoPro, yeah. and, you, and you can kind of go crazy with it. So we've been having fun with that. Yeah, and I would say again, we're gonna get hit here again on DJI, but but I recently nine ten drones, right? The thing I tell people is these drones, and you see, I don't know, chopper shot. Have, have, is anybody familiar with uh i think it's chopper shot chopper shoot uh out there in dubai that's one thing i saw them start incorporating the fpv around the camels and stuff and i was like that is not the next thing but that is going to be getting integrated because folks are going to learn how to do that commercially and add it to video and again it's it's not about how you're capturing a shot from a new angle that you never had before so if it's a gopro on there it doesn't matter it's just something that we haven't seen and what you said about DJI and the reason that I went DJI is because it was recommended. Like I'm used to this controller. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Naturally, naturally to go with the DJI FPV, it was just kind of, and then having crystal sky batteries, like it was this weird connection, but I am, uh, I'm glad you guys brought that up. Um, it's, it's a ton of uh, fun and it takes things to, to another level. Um, so no, I think that it, even past it just being fun, right, the entire nature of what people are looking for out of video right now is shifting. Um, I mean, they're more comfortable with the idea that they're going to watch a recorded webinar and Zoom call and, hey, we can all dial in from our phones and what do we need a big camera for? You know, you're seeing national brands jump to having a lot more found footage, especially mm -hmm. during COVID, but even just more generally, I think after this, there's going to be a lot more cell phone footage that's like vertical within a horizontal frame on purpose and it feels casual. And I feel like there's an element of that with the FPV stuff and the more, you know, like you said, with the corkscrews and going around stuff, people want to see that fresh angle. And I think they're open to faster cuts. They really were trying to stop the scroll more than anything. So, hey, let's flash them in the first couple of seconds a little bit. I mean, not to get, you know, to simplify it too much, but basically, like, how do you grab somebody's attention? It has to be something really different and really cool. And that's not always the slow, cinematic, uh -huh. you know, creeping through the forest type shots that all of us love and all of us would love to do that. Um, but man, sometimes it's something just really different, like, you know, mount a GoPro on top of an eagle and let it soar and all the crazy stuff that's gone viral over the years, you know, um, just remarkable where people can put cameras. Yeah. And you brought up a really good point, too, as far as with the portrait mode and everything. The portrait mode is getting common. We've been working for the past year for this new network, Quibi, and that's, oh, wow, cool. everything, that's everything they're doing. It's like we have to change our frame guidelines and everything, just yeah. like how we're shooting, and uh, it's super surreal. It's just kind of, it kind of makes me cringe a little bit, but I also kind of like it too. So it's like <laughs> different though, and you can, you can change the way you shoot things going to this new method too yeah. so it's like it make it opens up more ideas yeah it's a little they're bit like a mobile first video consumption platform right like they're like hey you're sitting on the subway watch it on your phone series yeah. original series yeah that's so cool and it's all like it's all short content too so it's it's like for that way if you're sitting on the subway for six to eight minutes you can get a whole series in so but as Jimmy said, it's been kind of weird. It's like listening to a director go on center punch and put him in the center. It's like you're trying to make this cinematic shot and they all they want is like something in the center of the frame because they, because of this vertical aspect. So it's been kind of a challenge, but it's been fun too. 
just put them on the rule of thirds as long as it's the center third. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> how are you? How are you guys shooting that? What platform are you using for that? Are you like Mavic? We using Inspired Two, Inspired okay. as well as Mavic. Uh, we did a show called Barkitecture for them that came out, and we also did a show called Skirt, which was with Offset, um, where they had all these race cars and all these like million dollar cars, and we kind of went around and filmed them. But so they've been using both. Uh, Mavic uh, Two Pro is what we've been using for the Barkitecture show, and then Inspire. To uh, we shot like a single man operation for the skirt show, so it was a lot of fun. So okay, we're gonna I'm gonna end hardware here on this. The Mavic, the Mavic Pro, you could rotate the camera, you could rotate the camera and shoot vertical, and then just don't like. No, we don't want like we don't want that anymore. I mean, is any were you guys familiar with that on the Mavic Pro? The ability to you know rotate the camera, shoot. Up and down. I don't know if I've ever tried. I'm, I'm not gonna yeah. lie. I, I don't, it, that makes me want to cringe. I know that that's kind of like the cheapest yeah. thing to do is the, <laughs> the vertical. I just, I'm sorry, but I, I just am not there yet. I guess if I had a client that wanted that look, I would do it. But it's just like, oh no, 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 I just can't. I try to avoid the vertical at yeah. all costs. Us as well. I mean, we'll just pretty much deliver it in 4K, and they can crop it however they want. <laughs> Yeah. Gotcha. Well, because I when I you know two years ago when I'm doing the Facebook and your and you know your Instagram stories, you're wanting to share things and you're pulling that imagery out. Um, you know, sometimes I would just say, "Hey, I'm just going to turn this whole thing sideways, and people can rotate their phone and they can enjoy it that way." But yeah, I understand that that crop, and that's we're not going to do that at Christy Low Productions. No. <laughs> no, they can crop it out. I agree. 4K and crop it all you want. I'm not shooting it that way. But you bring up a great point, Paul, that like if it's intended for that, it'd be worth a try to see how, because then I guess you get more data on the top and the bottom since it'd be a taller frame versus the horizontal. That'd be really it's, interesting to see. It's, yeah. It's terrible for flying, right? In regards yeah. to being able to see you turn it this way and like half it goes black. And uh, yeah, just they got rid of that. So. I, I don't even think we were aware that it could actually do that. So we're, I'm, I'm interested now. So. The, yeah. the, the lens rotated, like the whole camera rotated. It, it, I, I think a lot of people were doing that for like panorama work, right? So they'd go up, put it in one spot, and then go around and, and you know, take 12 shots vertical and piece them. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, look, at, look into that. I don't know if you can dig up a Mavic... Uh, you dig up a Mavic Pro. I don't know what you guys got back there. Oh, yeah, no, we have one. We have, we, have a, we have the first series Mavic Pro that we got originally. Now we have a couple of Mavic Pro 2s, so. Yeah. But yeah, I feel like it'd be weird to fly it, though, in portrait mode, because I feel like I would lose so much of my FPV, basically. <laughs> like, I'm, So now it's like I'm going to be super cautious about getting for. I could probably get that shot for you on accident. I can't even see what I flying. really want to see. I don't know. <laughs> Christy, you're not that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't mean to go vertical, but I did. Whoops. <laughs> um, okay, so real quick, um, I don't want. Do you guys know Paul? Um, Paul Jones had asked. We had a question. The resolution on the FPV goggles. I know you're pulling in with the air unit. You're getting 1080 um, mm -hmm. live view. And I think you're recording 1080 video, but the megapixel, from what I know, is like pretty low. I think it's like, yeah. yeah. It's pretty grained. It's pretty grainy, but it is 1080, but it's just on the lower end of 1080. Uh, but it, I mean, it, it looks great. It looks, For FPV, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Like, I yeah. haven't seen any other headset come close to it. But no, if you're trying to like record it for like awesome, oh, amazing a, stuff, yeah. you just go to your GoPro or whatever. I'd give you have it, it's on more it. of like a strong 720, probably. You know? In the mm -hmm. latency, I would speak to this because I've flown the analog before. The digital of the FPV, because Paul asked, was asking about just the latency, um, it's very, very low latency. And what we see now is uh, companies like, uh, I think it's Fat Shark. These other FPV companies are actually now bringing out this digital age. They're, they're, they're introducing this because it, it's incredible. Um, yeah. But so software, just, just don't want to spend a ton of time. I just want to kind of ask, because I'm even taking notes here. I um, am, am not going to release my secrets, you know, what 910 Drones is doing, because it's not, uh, people, people would be like, whoa, you know, you're only using that. But uh, what are you guys using for editing? And <laughs> don't laugh, Jimmy. Um, in regards to, uh, 
in regards to editing and Chrissy, we can start with you. Like, is it just like Premiere Pro? Are you doing any additional stuff? And just real quick, just so folks know what you guys do. Super basic, super simple at this Christy Lowe Productions. We've got the Adobe Creative Suite. So we're primarily Premiere Pro, After Effects, and, that, and Photoshop for stills, that's it. We're not doing anything too crazy complicated because we don't need to. Awesome. Ben? Um, yeah, so we do a lot in Adobe for all of our different clients. Um, a lot of our motion design and animation is all in After Effects, um, but we are a little bit unique and we're one of the few creative shops that is a Final Cut fanboy. So we have been uh, through all the iterations over the years of Final Cut back when it was, you know, Final Cut Suite 7 and even before on OS 9. Uh, and then coming forward to when it was really bad for a few years and we kind of rode the wave through that, tried to go away for a little bit and go edit on PC and said, man, I forgot how much I hated Windows computers and came right back. So um, today we, we do all of our editing off of a uh, uh, 100 terabyte NAS server from QNAP that's based in our office. Everybody runs over 10 G lines to IMACs and each of the iMac has a uh, you know a copy of Final Cut Pro 10 and then the full Adobe suite. So we're primarily editing off of shared storage on Final Cut 10. Awesome. awesome. Uh, Jimmy, Trevor? Uh, I got nothing impressive like that. Um, <laughs> same, same as Christy. Uh, we're pr Premiere and, after, and a little bit of After Effects, but honestly, it's more Premiere than anything. That's, uh, that's my main, that's my main bread and butter. I'd say the majority of our clients there are Avid based. So like when we're delivering footage, most of the time that, that uh, the companies that, you know, big production companies are, you know, either Avid or Premiere based, but it's a lot of Avid as well. Awesome. Great. And you bring up a point, right? It, to move kind of out of software a little bit and get into clients. Um, you just mentioned that you may not be even doing a final video, like your deliverable, is just um, raw video. So yeah. you guys want to talk a little bit about that and which you prefer and... Uh... I mean, I think the majority of it's client-based because each kind of codec gives you a different look and, you know, and it's what they're working with in their home systems too. So, you know, the majority of the time, I think we're probably in a ProRes 422, like kind of HQ um, on our Inspire 2 as, because the Cine DNG files get a little too large for a lot of our clients, you know, because at that point we're filling up 500 terabyte SSDs in, a, in less than an hour. So the, uh, the ProRes format gives them plenty of latitude and, and most, most of our clients are pretty happy with that. Yeah, I mean, once in a while, depending on the company, depending on where, what country they're coming from too, they may want 444, they may want uh, DNG. Some people love just hearing that word raw. So they are just like DNG, give me DNG. Yeah. So then I lose three SSDs in six <laughs> hours. So then, you know, someone's, someone's downloading it as fast as they possibly can. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, most of the time. Most of the time it's ProRes 422. And if you've never tried the Thunderbolt reader for your SSDs, I highly suggest it. It's fantastically fast um, compared to USB 3.0. Um, it's, it's a game changer. So to the folks tuning in, what I'm hearing is as you go up with your platform and your equipment in regards to um, capabilities and complexity, you're also introducing even more um, steps into your workflow in, in regards to, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your drives, file sizes, um, you know, the more, the more that your platform has in regards to capabilities, the more you have to know and have to be aware of, so. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to spend tens of thousands of dollars on data storage solutions over the years. Oh. I mean, and it's very easy to not keep a pulse on how much data you're creating. And then when you think about with RAID and everything, like you really don't want to fill it all the way up and you really need to have a separate mirrored copy. That's what we do for offsite stuff, right? So data storage becomes pretty expensive pretty quick. Um, and we certainly, you know, we all have an obligation to our clients to safeguard what we do for them. Um, and so it, it becomes an interesting IT problem that I think is kind of different than most people, like most people's kind of creative brains. It's much more of a technical mm -hmm. issue. And to me, it's never been one that's been super interesting to solve. So for us, we had to go out and get some professional help and consultants uh, in on uh, kind of advising how to do that best. Yeah, I mean, there's only, you can yeah, only- Yeah, editing. Go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Jimmy. 
Yeah, well, and just from an editing standpoint, not, you know, despite handing over the raw footage, right, when you're shooting in 4K or whatever, and you're trying to upload all these clips in raw, editing with it, right? And I've got pretty high-speed computer systems, two of them that were designed for video editing, but when you take it up to all these huge projects that are all 4K, and you're trying to churn through all that data, it, it poses a lot of challenges, and I've had to, um, fortunately, I'm on the... Um, fixed price um, technical support plan. So when I'm trying to render out um, a project or edit with a project and Adobe is screaming at me going, no, this isn't going to work and my computers aren't cooperating, I call tech support and go, what do I need to do? Like, help me fix this. So that's a valid point to, to think about when you're getting into these higher, um, these drones with higher capabilities, how are you gonna process all of that on the backside? Yeah, because really there's only so far you can go with uh, two terabyte lacy rugged drives, you know, so <laughs> it's, uh, and, and, you know, my, my Mac's even a little older and barely plays the 4K footage. So it's, there's really, <laughs> there is a whole scale of, of, you know, as you go up, you know, the, the hardware becomes more expensive. And, <laughs> and this just shows too, like for us, like how much, like we don't ever touch the media. The only thing that we touch with the media afterwards is like for, you know, like our, yearly reel that we'll do or whatever but like editing is not our strong suit by any means necessary and um but well, yeah that's well, we, but we still do we we store a copy for our clients you know for up to a year so just in case they have any issues and so you know that uh, providing that service to them and gives them kind of peace of mind and allows us to have the year to kind of cut our reel and and um and but it, you know as i said we have about probably 32 terabyte lacy drives and all kinds yeah. of backups and so it's so what it becomes we, pretty challenging pretty quick we uh I, we've thrown ourselves pretty heavily into the thunderbolt 3 world and try to have every computer have thunderbolt 3 everything be 10 gigabit connections um i've always been in the mindset that hey if you have one coffee copy, copy you have none uh and if i have three i feel really good about it so we we try to have an entirely copied set of our, all of our data since 2008 for every client ever off-site so that if the office building downtown burned down, we could go take the other locate, the one that's at my house and then bring it to the new office, wherever that is, maybe in the you know yard down the street and uh, set up shop there and kind of plug in and keep on rolling. And the cool thing is we actually do that syncing through Google Drive. We've had a lot of uh, good luck with Google Drive lately. And you know, you pay for G Suite, like probably like a lot of folks do. Um, so we get unlimited uh, drive storage through them and we've never had any challenges with that. They, they throttle you to 750 gigs a day of transfer um, but for the most, so, you know, sometimes when you do your initial seed, it'll take a long time if you've been out on a shooting for a while, but in general, that's been really reliable. And the coolest thing is every time we kick something out from the editor, it's immediately streaming up to Google drive at that moment. So sometimes we have to mail out hard drives and stuff like that, but like overwhelmingly, you know, the majority of the time we can just shoot over a cloud link, like in, within, within an hour of when we kicked it out of the editor. Most major companies, it seems like are going to that to like I have both my I have two roommates and both both are one's a sound engineer one's an editor and they're all everything that they do is all going through the servers now the servers now are like that's the main dependency because it's just there's no physical way to just keep all that stuff without having just racks and racks and racks of data which is so much oh yeah for sure I learned that fast because I I, <clears throat> I had my start in drones, right? So I was flying the drones and I was like, I'm going to get into the video and recording everything in the highest resolution possible. And all of a sudden, like, my hard drive's full, this hard drive's full. I'm not sure what I'm, I want to save and keep the media because I don't want to just get rid of it. And it's like, oh my gosh, you guys want to sell me an 8K drone now? Like, what? what? Does it come with a hard drive? Does it come with a Google <laughs> Cloud subscription for a year or something? Like, that is crazy. Um, but what you mentioned, Jimmy, was about editing and, you're, and, and like maybe you're not doing that as much now. But one thing I think is important uh, when you're starting out and what's, what helped me collect better in, uh, video was the fact that I started editing. Because when I first went out and shot video and then I, I come back and I was recording the whole time. You know what I mean? I'm just recording everything. And now I've got to chop up this 20-minute video into these clips and very quickly I realized that you capture what you need and then you, you have that plan, right? So the, the, the idea, the vision. Um, and you're, 
You're exactly right too, because that's how I basically got into this industry. It was exactly that. It was uh, iMovie HD, I think it was yeah. back in the day, um, <laughs> and then like the GoPro <laughs> Hero. So it was literally this is when you had to do like S1, S2, S3. You know, like you didn't even know what it was shooting unless you took the SD card out, put it in your laptop, and like, oh, okay. But uh, first I messed up with that, and then I was up till five in the morning each night, and I was like, this is the most fun thing I've ever done. Like, how do I just do this for a living? Which eventually led me to go into <laughs> school. And then I was learning Final Cut, uh, which I wanted to learn. And then once Final Cut started doing its phase, then I went to Premiere. So like, I know the basics, and, but it was the major part. And then when I got into the industry, when I fell in front of a camera, I was like, oh no, this is what I was meant to do. But editing, you're exactly right, steps the way for a lot. It makes you learn exactly about what you are shooting, understanding your time, understanding resolutions your uh the data uh it just it's all there so you're, you're exactly right bring up a really good point of the idea that hey the same person who's behind the camera can also be the same person behind the computer we we don't really do the traditional like you know i don't know call it the la style department based like filming right usually we're we're the only player on set like our set is just whatever we come up with and it's usually our people from the agency and it's you know for corporate clients and so we're not usually bringing like 20 different people out and all that sort of stuff so for us we can kind of keep that controlled environment and i think that's been really special as we've grown to have the same people concept storyboard uh, go through the process, talk to the client, go out and be very intimately familiar with the concept they're trying to pull off in terms of a look and then come back and turn it around and then present the concept once we go through the edit. That's been really appreciated by clients. So I would encourage everybody at least to consider the idea of becoming tuned up on all facets of it. Because like you said, right, if, if you didn't know anything about editing at all, oh my gosh, how could you possibly do you know, <laughs> what you do today? So I think there's something to be said for being well-rounded in this world uh, so you can kind of get along with others on, on set, but then also just kind of guide your clients to the right solution too. Yeah, excellent. Um, so now, uh, just at this time, I want to kind of move into um, getting clients in the beginning when you first started, and then what is that like now? Like, how has your process, your, uh, uh, yeah, your process in regards to getting new business, keeping business, how has that changed from when you started to what you're doing now, what's the same, maybe what's different, and then what information or, or insight might you be able to provide to, to the people that are tuning and listening? And uh, Christy, I don't know if you wouldn't mind starting us off. Oh, yeah, sure, I don't mind. Um, so <laughs> in terms of the drone work specifically, or me getting clients? Just video, video production work in general, and, okay. and then, um you can maybe speak to has the drone been a helpful uh mm -hmm. tool in regards to like getting your clients yeah so for me to be honest i had my company now for 10 years and when i started this business my my goal was to be the producer and not the person behind the camera you know I, I, or i didn't want it to be the technical one um so I was thinking I would outsource all of that. Um, and so I went after clients from a um, public relations kind of perspective, bringing in my experience as a producer, um, script writer, and saying, I've got the storytelling background from all those years in news, and that's what's gonna make me a little different than say, a videographer that you might hire off the street who might be pretty good at capturing images, but doesn't know how to tell a story, right? So that's kind of how I developed getting clients in the beginning. And really that hasn't changed. Um, uh, the storytelling aspect of a video production for what I do for my commercial clients and my government clients is huge. And so I have to be able to, to kind of give them the whole package. Um, I'm not just shooting and delivering raw footage. Sometimes I am, but not usually. I'm giving them the whole package start to finish. Um, so I get a lot of my clients through networking, not so much placing ads online or, or any of the traditional ways of marketing, 
it's through knowing people and meeting people and talking to people and them understanding what I do and then making those introductions to the kind of clients that I want to work for has been the biggest help for me. Not to say that I don't run ads on social media and things like that. I do. Um, and I do get customers who are just doing a good old fashioned Google search, right? And mm -hmm. your name pops up, they call you, you go down that route. But I get a, most of my business from the relationships and the networking that I've formed. And that really hasn't changed. That's been consistent. I will say that, that incorporating the drone work into what we do has helped. I won't say that it has made, when I got into drones, I really thought, wow, this is going to open up a lot more doors for me and I'm going to get these drone only jobs, right? I'm going to get these jobs that are just drone heavy stuff and I'll be able to maybe do some insurance um, jobs, you know, inspecting roofs after a hurricane or be able to go out and help emergency personnel, you know, with searches in disasters, things like that was kind of what I thought I would get into when I got the drone. And it really didn't go that way. But what has happened is now it's enabled me to give my clients an even better overall package, right, on their marketing and training videos that they wouldn't have gotten without the drone. So I, I do think it has helped. It's made me a more well-rounded person and a more well-rounded offering for my clients. So I'm glad I did it. But it didn't go, when I got into the drone side of things, it didn't go like I thought it would. Does that make sense? It does, like the, the billion dollar industry that everybody. Right, and now everybody's got one. <laughs> I mean, that's the other thing, right? All these companies like the electric companies and people that I thought would, I could leverage my government contracting side of the house to go out and do inspections of power lines and things like that. Well, they've all gotten their staff trained to do that now, most of them. And they've got people that fly drones in house because it's cheaper. Yeah. So, so for, you know, kind of how I thought it might go on the government contracting side of things, it really hasn't, but it has been great for my overall video production capabilities. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, ben, you want to, yeah, man. So, uh, you know, getting clients obviously is the lifeblood of any business. Uh, nobody succeeds without sales, but lots of creative people hate selling. Um, and I was reading this morning that, you know, what you're doing in the sales process is you're trying to guide someone to an end result that they truly need and that will truly benefit them. So realistically, all you're doing is just helping a friend make a decision uh, and you just happen to know more than they do. So I think that we take that consultative approach to selling here uh, at Nine Miles, and that's what we've built our business on since 2008. Um, our goal is never to kind of connect somebody with a resource they don't necessarily need. But that being said, we, we are guides and counselors for our clients in order to help them make the right decision. So what we try to do is not just focus on, you know, just drones, certainly, but not even really just like only creative as a means to an end or solely as an art project. A lot of people are about creating really high end art in the space. And, and there's a time and place for that. And there's a value to that. But to most businesses and to most folks who are focused on, hey, how do we get our marketing message out there? They don't necessarily need art, or maybe they do and they just don't know how, but what they really need is they need a solution. So they need someone who can have, yes, they've got the creative chops and the talent and, and kind of the sexy new media type creation angle to it, but what are they gonna do with it? So where are you gonna end up putting, and I'm just talking mainly in, co in corporate and commercial, which is what we focus on, right? So where are you gonna end up putting that video or putting that piece of creative and what's it gonna do for you? So for us, we focus on primarily not just creating art, but actually creating things that have a business case behind them. So we try to predict out the ROI of investing in a commercial campaign. So that means a one-off investment in content up front and the creative up front, and then an ongoing retainer-based agreement for us to do paid search and paid social and distribute that piece of content and achieve some sort of measurable ROI. We do a ton with the follow-up that happens afterwards. So we get people to opt into content, see the really cool new media content, opt into it, and then take the next step that ultimately leads in our view, to a sales conversation, some kind of booked appointment or some sort of opportunity for the business. So that's what we focus on. Since we made that shift about two years ago, the entire script has changed and everything has changed about our business. We're seen as a valuable sales optimization and business process partner, in addition to being able to do the really cool creative stuff. Um, and so that's what's allowed us to, to have over $27 million in direct ad management experience with positive ROI and results for our clients. 
and we get to go do the fun, cool production stuff. So that's what kind of flipped the script. We wanted it to pay for itself and not just be an expense, but an investment. So I'd encourage anybody who has interest in that side of digital marketing, in addition to all the cool, fun production stuff we talk about, consider getting you know education in that. Consider partnering up with people who are really good in that. Because if you can offer that as a, as a whole package, you can speak the language of a business owner and a business professional a little bit differently than just talking to a person that's a fellow creative. That's uh, a good point because I think it's, and, and, it, and it speaks to anything in the drone industry in regards to energy uh, industry, power distribution, inspections. You take this tool, the flying camera, you put it in the air and you capture the data. We all would love, like as a drone, as a drone operator, if I could just dump raw, unedited on you all day, that's, I just want to go out and fly. The problem is some of the folks that I've been able to connect with, they don't know what to do with that stuff. I could tell them all day how beneficial video will be, um, pictures, 3D models, you know, all these things I can do with a drone. But if they don't know what to do once I give it to them, they're never going to want it. So being able to kind of come in and take it another step and say, hey, I can cre create this video, but maybe I also can help you uh, do some Facebook advertisement. Hey, yeah. do you have the Google pixel on your, or do you have the Facebook pixel on your website? You know, if they don't have the Facebook pixel on their website, like boom, you're, you're adding this value. And I don't mean to, you know, go on this weird non-drone thing, but just to touch on your point, if you can offer a little bit more, in the beginning, it's gonna help you build that foundation. And then maybe you find that like, hey, people know we're really good at video. So we're, now all of our clients just want video. Um, with that being said. Yeah, we saw that too. And, and I think even really big nationally traded, like huge brands oftentimes need all the help they can possibly get. We would do huge work on the creative side for big brands and then it would go nowhere because they kind of got lost in the shuffle and there's another agency in the mix and hey, did it ever really achieve anything? Oh, we don't really know 10 degrees of separation. So as close as we can be to the action from start original concepting all the way through that final distribution and measuring what was the result, like that to us is what we love. We love knowing for a fact that, hey, this made a huge difference because we got an 8X ROI in 120 days with the campaign. Like that's awesome because then they'll come back to you for a long time. Yeah, that's great. And uh, Jimmy and, and Trevor, any, you guys want to kind of talk about in the beginning, what's a little bit different? And uh, yeah, I think for, for Jimmy and I, in the beginning, we were kind of in the ideal position to kind of, you know, take the drone into the productions we were already doing. I mean, for, for myself, I was, a, I was 10 years already in the production uh, industry as a cameraman and Jimmy was on the tech side of it all. So, um, you know, being kind of in that position and seeing the drone and what it could do uh, for productions and, 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 and it just kind of being fun too, right? You're like, at that point, you're trying to play video games for a living, right? It's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, I'd, I'd have a joke with my dad. It's like, where are these video games and RC cars going to get you? You know, and it's like, well, here I am, dad, you know, I'm flying my drone around and, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it really became a kind of a tool on the production side that, that, that every production wanted and needed because it, it eliminated the helicopter shots, you know? So um, being kind of at the front end and we, we jumped on the Phantom 2, 2 thing and, and it allowed us to, you know, kind of expand what we were doing as cameramen and tech people and offer another thing that we could jump on on a production. So you'd go on as a cameraman and a drone operator. Now they're getting double bang for their buck, you know? So a lot of the productions really jumped on that and, and it took our prior experience and added kind of an extra layer to it and, and it made it made a really marketable product for us. So, and it didn't really start as drone only things. It started as, you know, come on and be a camera assistant and drone or shoot and drone. and and, and now it's kind of evolving to that where it's just becoming more like drone, just drone only jobs for us. So, yeah, I don't know if you I mean, to add to it. Uh, I mean, can't really add much more. Um, I would, um, the one major thing I guess would be like, if anyone's really interested in going down the path of like doing drones and video production, I think the major thing is to understand uh, set etiquette to understand what happens on set and how the different departments work, how the, the story comes to life. I think it makes a big impact on that individual to understand what to be expected from them when they arrive on set. 
how to how to approach things, how to who to talk to, when to talk. Um, those are all major things you have to know. So I would say if anyone's really interested, start off as a you know production assistant in the film industry and start working your way up in that field. I mean, we all did it, and it's and it's my favorite thing to do in the world. I love it, and I I, I don't ever want to do anything else after that. But the biggest thing was understanding how set worked. Um, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't grow up in about it. So like when I, I just went to school for it and it was the best thing I ever did for myself. So I would say if you're really interested in video production, just going in that field and putting yourself out there and start working on small sets, big sets, whatever you can, just to kind of get the idea of what you can do and how you can provide your services. And I guess if you even enjoy it, right? Yeah, it's a crazy win. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, we kind of got off topic but with, so the clientele kind of just followed from that you know we, we already were kind of established in production as as with what we did before and then adding the drone and, and that all and and really for us client retention is just kind of our main thing like we always want to keep make keep our clients as happy as possible and then that way word of mouth you know the business that we're in it's the biggest little business you've ever been involved in right you think it's this huge industry but it's really word of mouth and, and networking spreads like fire good or bad so um you know most of our business is either from retained clients or from from referrals that that clients are putting out to new people yeah that's that's excellent um there, what I would say, so that's great, Jimmy, you mentioned, like, you give out that bit of advice to folks that, like, hey, if you want to get involved, get involved. Um, so for anyone, because there's folks watching um, and dogs barking as well. <laughs> yeah, your dog's watching too. <laughs> yeah, and she, yeah, she, she just wants to be part of the show, but... For those folks I feel like this is the fun of like COVID. Like everybody's gotten to know everyone else's dogs and interesting pets and their significant others and everybody in the background of everybody's Zoom calls. It's interesting time to be alive. It's, it's great, and I'm and I'm glad because now we we are prepared. We will all be prepared for the next sit in your house and, and hide or hang out. We'll all be uh, socially uh, not distancing uh, here. But anyway, so. That's that, that piece of advice. So I would say there's some folks that are, are tuned in that are watching and they have a drone, right? They, maybe they have a website, maybe they have a Facebook, but what other than, you know, try to get on set, how can people build that network or, or what suggestion just like in a few sentences to, to someone tuning in and, and maybe letting them know like, Hey, it's not about equipment. It's about, getting that experience, get CyberLink, PowerDirect, or get something cheap. Well, what would you say, Ben? So my AirPods are dying. What a time to be alive, right? Well, I'm, I've been swapping back and forth. Oh, my gosh. The audio is so bad now. Oh, guys, <laughs> do you hear that? His AirPods died. First world problems. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I'll keep it quick. So I am a huge fan of uh, talking to your target customer and asking them informational interviews about, hey, what would be valuable to you in this? So leverage the people you already know, leverage folks who have businesses or people who they, they know. And every time you meet with somebody just for coffee or virtually these days, right? It's even easier, honestly. You have even less of an excuse. You can just do it over Zoom. 10 minute coffee virtual. Um, if you send out 100 messages on LinkedIn, which is the number that you can send out per day, and you're just getting started and you have no network, you could connect with 100 people. And in that, you could just say, hey, you know, I'm just starting out. I really wanted to get your feedback on this idea. Do you mind jumping on a five to 10 minute virtual coffee with me? I think if you send out 100 of those for a week, there's a really good chance you're gonna have the chance to talk to some people who know a few things. And once you do that, maybe for a couple of weeks, you're gonna know a lot more than you do today. So I would encourage everybody in their local market with whoever they think their target customer is, if they're just starting out, just go talk to them. And those people at the end of the call, just ask them for one more recommendation of somebody else to talk to. And, and that kind of will build on itself and go from there as a snowball effect. And if I had to start all over with nothing, that's what I'd be doing. Just build the personal relationships and go from there. But ask questions from your customer and don't assume. Excellent. Bill, I would say to just some that is like build trust, build trust with people and, and let them know who you are. Um, Christy? Yeah, I think that what Ben said is, is a valid point. And when you're first starting out, you asking people what is of value to them is huge because you shouldn't just assume what you think is going to be important to them because it may not be. Um, for me personally, an another thing I would add to that, what Ben said is 
in your local market, go to some networking group meetups. You know, once this whole stay at home thing is gone and they start meeting again in public, go to some of these business networking events, go to some of these industry events, these trade shows, these um, meetups, the social gatherings where there are other professionals there that you can network with. That way you're kind of in person building that trust and that likability. And that's been huge for me. Um, like I said, 90% of my business is referrals from either people I've met or clients that I've gotten who've been happy with my work and have referred me to other clients. So I agree with the, hey, network and do some Zoom coffee chats on LinkedIn where professionals hang out and try and make connections that way. But in your local market, go to some in-person business meetups too, if you can do it. It's a great way to get started. Awesome. Jimmy, uh, Trevor, Trevor, you want to add? Any? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, definitely in, in order to get into our industry, I think you just got to get out there and meet people as well. I think the networking thing is, is key to, to anything in this whole thing. It's, it's uh, make, uh, establishing those personal relationships and being able to provide what you say you're going to provide. Like, I, I think that's a lot of the problem in our industry. You know, everybody promises the world and delivers, you know, half. And so I think, you know, definitely just networking and, and, you know, the bad stuff spreads faster than the good. So it's like, you really got to make an effort to, to really like deliver what you promise at all times, because you, you could deliver nine times out of 10. And then the one time that you don't is the time that everybody hears about it. Right. So you really, I think establishing those personal relationships and, and building trust. And I think that gets a really good word of mouth out there and it, it can it really helps you. So. And I guess I'll just add like for me, like, I mean, just like if you really wanted to start in this industry in general, like, I mean, that's all we can really say is like, just li reach out to your local production companies. They're always looking for help. And it's so easy. Like, I guarantee you, if you just offer your assistance for a day, just to intern under a grip or under a camera operator or whatever, they're going to be more than willing to go above and beyond as long as you show up with, uh, as long as with an honest attitude and willing to work hard. You and it's all in front of you and no one's going to deny you. Excellent. So having that network, connecting with people that you already know, because it's the people that you already know that could point you in the right direction or provide you that. And, um, uh, I, I would say this, when I met Christy, I was sitting in the office of one of my clients, uh, who I do some photography for and she was doing a video for uh, Someone that did work with this client and I was like, you know I see her with the cameras and her crew and like I'm telling you I'm green like as green as the in, in regards to video as the back as her backdrop and I'm thinking like man How am I gonna? Man, how, how am I gonna get her? You know what I mean? Like who is this person and we we, we talked and you know, I think she I think she uh, wished, you know, she asked, you know, what are you doing with drones? She was like, yeah, you know, I hope you do well and, and everything. And then it, it went from there, but it came to this point where I realized it's not about pushing all these people away. It's about reaching out and, and building that network. Don't be afraid of this paradigm of scarcity, right? This idea that there's not enough to go around. There's plenty. And the people that are willing to put in the work, you know, are, are going to find those rewards. And you can see, Jimmy and Trevor sitting next to each other, they could have tried to do this by themselves as individuals, you know, but they, they identified that together as a team, you know, they can accomplish great things. So again, reaching out, connecting with other local um, video folks and, and seeing how you can offer and assist. And I'd say with Ben, I sat on a, a, a webinar due to coronavirus with Ben and Ben was on it. You know, he and I could have just never spoke again, or we could, I could have been like, oh, what is he doing? He has drones and like, stay away. But no, we decided we just connected and, and, and have gone from there. And then in regards to being able to connect with Glide Aerials, it's just a matter of reaching out and saying, hey guys, what are you doing? You know, are you willing to connect with my audience? And uh, I, during this time more than ever, I've forced myself to connect with people because I can't get out and drive and go knock on doors. And social media allows you to connect with folks that are outside of your normal network and people are hanging out at home. They're looking for other opportunities. So it's a great time to jump on LinkedIn, create that account, just start talking and, and chat with people. Don't be the person that just friends them. And then that's it, you know, put that request out and then make that uh, connection. So, man, I really appreciate all your guys' time. 
One thing I do want to say, uh, I forgot to mention this at the top of the hour, happy belated birthday uh, to Trevor Bryson. Uh, it was his birthday oh, yesterday. So uh, happy birthday, Trevor. Um, Appreciate it, Ron. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. And uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Christy, for coming on. Thank you, Ben, for coming on. Thank you, Jimmy. And thank you, Trevor. Um, really appreciate your guys' time and attention. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, push this webinar out um, on YouTube and get it up on the site, you know, for others who are interested in drones and video production to, to check out and, uh, you know, and tune in. And to anybody that's watching, um, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to uh, uh, let you guys each have just a final word. Go ahead and plug your business. Let people know how they can reach and connect with you guys um, if you want. So, uh, Christy? Yep. Awesome. I appreciate you having me. This has been a blast. We should do this more often. Mm -hmm. um, you guys can reach out to me anytime. I'd love to um, give you some ideas, um, collaborate with you on projects. Um, you can reach us at christylowproductions.com and it's spelled C-H-R-I-S-T-I-L-O-W-E productions.com. And same thing on social at Christy Low Productions. We'd love to meet you. Awesome. Um, Ben, you want to go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, really appreciate the time today, guys. It's been awesome. Uh, Nine Miles is on a mission to create passionate brand ambassadors for our clients. That's what we're all about, if that resonates with you. And drones are just a small part of that. But if anybody that you know needs that sort of assistance, especially in the Raleigh area, we're based right downtown. And we'd love to chat. Just search Nine Miles Media on Google. Uh, the story of how we called it Nine Miles Media is because my buddy and I, who started it when I was 14 years old in 2008, we live nine miles apart. So there's your answer to the trivia question of the day. Uh, right now, we're doing something that we're trying to give back um, in this in the scheme of kind of coronavirus themed things. So we are actually looking for two nonprofit organizations who are well deserving, who are trying to get messages out. Um, and because we can't do much live action production at the very moment, we're doing tons more animation and motion design. So we're calling it Motion for Good. We're looking for two organizations who are really well deserving to get a full branding and marketing package in motion design, high end animation, totally for free. Um, so if you guys know anybody who is a well-deserving organization and charity, please send them our way. That's awesome. Thank you, Ben. And Jimmy and Trevor. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I mean, that was so good from Ben. Um, but <laughs> no, I mean, for us, uh, you can easily get a hold of us. You can either do Jimmy at GlideAerials.com or Trevor at GlideAerials.com. Uh, message us on Instagram, Facebook. Um, go to our website at gladarials.com, um, instos at gladarials. Um, but we're always there to respond to anybody, anybody who's interested. And if you're in the Los Angeles area, you want to come to Los Angeles once this whole COVID thing is all over, you want to, you want to come out with us, be a, be a visual observer or jump on the gimbal with us or, you know, learn how to do this. Be more than happy to talk to, with you and see what we can do to bring you in. Um, cause this is going to be a good year once everything comes back and we can't wait. Um, but yeah, message us at any time. And, and, thanks that, for having us. and thank you so much for having us. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you guys. That's awesome. I, I appreciate that. That's great, Ben. And then that offer, you know, anyone uh, tuning in, please do. If you know any of these organizations that could use the uh, motion for good, do reach out to uh, Ben. So again, I'm Paul Rossi with 910 Drones, based here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. You can check us out uh, online, 910drones.com, uh, and on social at 910drones. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you have any questions, uh, go ahead and reach out to all of us, and uh, have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. All right, bye-bye. See you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.